Um, welcome to the Community for Global Health Equity uh, seminar series on building blocks of equity. My name is Kasia Cordas and I co-direct the community. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome our, um, our panelists, our guests, as well as, um, as our audience members. Uh, in this series, I want to tell you a little bit about the series um, itself, and then I'll introduce our, um, our panelists for today. In this series, we have been exploring throughout uh, this academic year, how, uh, how do academics at all stages of their careers form effective uh, partnerships? Um, how can students and early career um, faculty engage in research um, in Global South communities? And how can students uh, contribute to building uh, equity? So we've had the pleasure of hosting teams of mentors and mentees to reflect on these questions alongside with their community partners. And we've been discovering how co-produced knowledge can promote health equity for individuals, how to understand the importance of training students to ethically and responsibly work with community partners, uh, learning how to develop reciprocal partnerships early on in their careers, and how to discuss barriers to educating students and how to co-produce knowledge. So today, it's my pleasure to introduce um, three speakers. Uh, uh, Jeff Good is professor in the Department of Ling Linguistics at the University at Buffalo. His language interests center around comparative and typological uh, investigations of Benue Congo, in particular its Bantoid subbranch, with a documentary focus on the languages of the lower Fungam region in Northwest Cameroon. He has also done significant work on um, Saramac and, and Atlantic uh, and Atlantic, and Atlantic Creole, sorry about that. Uh, our next guest is Vasily Kivita. She is an Onassis scholar and postgraduate researcher in, English, in linguistics at SOAS, University of London. Uh, she's also the social media coordinator for the Viral Languages Project, um, a super volunteer for the Endangered Languages Project and a linguistics consultant for language projects organized by the young historians um, of, um, Sansarol. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. You can correct me later, Vasiliki. Um, her academic interests include language documentation and description uh, with uh, revitalization and maintenance um, and uh, applied linguistics in general. Uh, she is a professional teacher of modern languages, including English and Greek, and is a freelance translator. And uh, also uh, a special welcome to, <laughs> I'm sorry, Dko by Dadak, it's the best I could do, uh, uh, who is a linguistic consultant with um, SIL International. His work focuses on language documentation and description and language development. He received his PhD from Leiden University on um, a project that involved grammar of the Chuvak language of Cameroon, and his work was supported by a grant from the Endangered, Endangered Languages Documentation Program. Uh, again, very welcome to all of you. Um, it's a pleasure to have you and to hear about uh, the work that you've all been uh, collaborating on. Over to you. Great, thank you. Well, I'll be starting the presentation. Um, let me get, okay, the screen share looks good, I hope. All right, good. Okay, so we're going to, um, all three of us will be speaking today, but I'm Jeff Good and I'll be starting. Thank you very much for that um, nice introduction for the three of us, Kasha. Um, and so you can kind of see the title here, it's Public Health Messaging and the Other 6,000 Languages. And so we're reporting on kind of a large team-based project, team-based effort that the three of us were part of, and we're all trying to represent sort of different facets, different aspects of the team. Um, let me introduce some of the speakers as well, right? So you've heard about some of them from Kasha, but just so you get the order of where they're presenting. So as Jeff Good, I'll be presenting first. Um, and as you just heard, I'm in the Department of Linguistics at UB. And then we'll hear from Vasily Key, who is currently, as you heard from SOAS University of London. And she's coming on, uh, a, some of the discussion emanates from our work on the Viral Languages Project, which I'll be introducing um, maybe within the next four or five minutes or so. Um, and Vasily Key, I served as one of the co-directors of the project. Vasily Key was the social media manager, social media coordinator for the project, and did some other work on it. And then the third person speaking today, Dikabai Dadak, um, 
he was, uh, as you heard, he has his PhD in linguistics, but he was also someone who actually worked on the ground on some translation associated with a project in the north of Cameroon. So hopefully each of us are representing different facets of that, of that work. Um, I want to start because I think for this particular audience, there may not be um, like a full understanding of the current distribution of global linguistic diversity. And I think our own understanding that is uh, of the presenters here today of that diversity kind of informs our approach um, and how we look at these things. So I just want to give some general figures. These are drawn from the Ethnologue. This is actually produced by the same organization that Ndokabai is part of, SIL International. Uh, it's sort of the broadest general reference source we have for all of the world's languages. The current count suggests that there are maybe somewhere around 7,000 languages used in the world today, including maybe around 150 or more catalog sign languages, um, although there are probably many more sign languages that have yet to be properly surveyed. Um, our understanding of sign language diversity um, remains even more understudied than um, our understanding of spoken language diversity. More than half of these languages seem to be associated with some kind of writing system, but in general, this does not mean that they're actually regularly written or read. Uh, more often, the most members of the relevant language community might be reading or, for the smaller languages, might typically read or write in a majority language. Um, so just to bear in mind, a lot of the languages that we're interested in supporting are languages that do not have any uh, sort of internal tradition of reading or writing, even if some writing system may have been developed at some point. When we look at these overall figures, around half of the world's languages um, are probably endangered at the moment. At least that's the kind of figure we usually throw around um, in linguistics, um, maybe 40%, maybe 60%. It's kind of hard to say. Um, and I think it's important to also keep in mind that in the last 20 years or so, there's been a lot of efforts to do linguistic research um, on endangered languages. And some of you may have heard about this in the media. But actually, when we look at the socioeconomically marginalized languages, it doesn't only include endangered languages. There are lots of languages with relatively large speaker populations, um, but they might be in countries that are dominated by a language with an even larger speaker population, which causes those languages to be somewhat marginalized. So there's this large class of middle-sized languages, um, which don't fall in the endangered language umbrella, but still actually are uh, lacking a lot of support. So one example, um, it's actually a relatively well-supported language. It has a writing system. People do read and you know read it regularly, but just to pick an example of the Marathi language of India, it has a similar number of speakers to German, so maybe around 80 million or so speakers. Um, but when I looked into it, I could only find three universities in the United States that say offer Marathi classes as an example, as opposed to, I don't know how many offer German, I didn't bother to look, must be hundreds. So here you have a language with a similar speaker population to German, but just doesn't really have the same degree of teaching support, uh, technology support, and other things as well. But 80 million speakers is a lot of people. However, it's in India where you also have Hindi, which is one of the world's most widely spoken languages. And so it's much smaller than Hindi. And then you're also in India where English is also used as a significant language as well. So there's this large middle group of undersupported languages alongside the endangered languages. Here's a chart I like to use um, that really illustrates the sort of inequitable distribution, we might say, of languages to speaker populations. So this chart is from 2005, but the situation won't have changed very much since then. It plots um, number of speakers a language has against sort of the rank of the language. Are you the most spoken language, second most spoken language, et cetera. This is based on first language speakers. You could also do this for first and second language speakers. It would probably still look largely similar. Um, you have a, a top cluster of languages like Mandarin, English, Spanish, et cetera, that are gonna be sort of on that first vertical line you end up with this clustering of languages in the middle that are languages with maybe hundreds of thousands to a few to some millions of speakers. However, maybe a few hundred languages um, are in that. And then most of the world's languages look like they have no speakers in a chart like this because of the highly skewed distribution of the very large languages against the very small ones. But there are still a lot of people who fit into that middle ground, those sort of middle ground languages with hundreds of thousands of speakers um, to millions of speakers. And, um, from the perspective of things like public health messaging, which is something that um, we as in the speakers today have been interested in, uh, there's a question about uh, how do they fit in, how do they get considered, and how should they be supported? Now, one reason why I think speakers of these middle-sized languages and the very small endangered languages are not considered as much as they probably should be is because multilingualism is so common across the world. Um, 
Now, I don't know, there may be, lot, there are lots of monolinguals in the world today, but monolingualism is probably historically quite aberrant for human speaker populations. Uh, if we go back to hunter-gatherer societies based on the ones we can observe today, multilingualism was probably the norm for most of human history. Um, and still today, lots of people are multilingual in different ways. Um, and because of that, there seems to be an, uh, an assumption in some kinds of, say, crisis and emergency communication literature that if you can translate messages into a small subset of the world's widely spoken languages, you can get the messages out to the people who need to hear them. Um, there are a lot of issues there. We're going to talk a lot about uh, in a few minutes that I'll talk about how language choice does matter and how a message is received and understood. But we also need to think about the fact that there are lots of different ways to know a language. So merely being multilingual doesn't necessarily mean you have the um, ability or the language skills that will cause you to receive a message in the way that someone thinks they can because they think you might know English or know Spanish or know Mandarin. There are lots, so there are lots of ways to know a language. One common way of knowing a language that doesn't get a lot of discussion in the US at least is what gets called receptive multilingualism, where you might understand a language but not be able to speak or sign that language. Uh, that could be useful for certain kinds of public health messaging, but it's only a one-way messaging because you wouldn't be able to ask questions. You can only sort of take in what you read. Um, there's also um, basically, and this is something more common in the academic space, you may only have reading knowledge uh, sort of or versus having oral knowledge, being able to hear a language and understand it, or if it's a sign language, understand it through sort of visual gestural modality as well. So you may only, um, you might hear, I'm, I'm trying, especially because this series is on equity, um, I'm trying to make an effort that has been uh, more strongly made within linguistics, especially in the last five years, just to make sure that we always do use language and, and discuss these ways, uh, talk about languages in ways that do include the sign languages. So if you see me use a term like language user rather than speaker or talk about visual comprehension, this is a conscious effort to make sure that sign languages don't get lost in the discussion because they very often are in these settings. Um, so you may have only reading knowledge. And then there's also knowledge of standard versus non-standard varieties. Uh, if a message is in American or British English that may or may not be fully comprehensible to say those who have good competence in African Englishes, my own experience in Cameroon is that speaking with my American accent is actually quite difficult for a lot of Cameroonians who are otherwise quite fluent English speakers because they're used to sort of more British derived varieties. So there's that issue as well. And then there's an issue of context of acquisition that's important to think about. Was the language learned at home? Was it learned in school? Was it learned on the street? Was it learned from friends? Was it learned from family? And all this may affect attitudes towards the use of the language and how messages in the language languages are received. Um, and then another point just to bring up that's a difficult problem in English, French is a little better this way. French has two words, multilingualism, and we might say plurilingualism if we pronounce this using the American pronunciation. Um, to distinguish between a multilingual society, we might say, say, that, say for instance, that Canada is a bilingual country because French and English are official language languages, but it doesn't mean that most Canadians are bilingual. So there's this individual level multilingualism versus societal multilingualism. And you have to bear that in mind as well when you think about public health messaging, because are you actually targeting two monolingual populations within a, a country, or are you actually targeting individuals who have mastery of multiple languages as well? So it's just something to bear in mind. And English, unfortunately, is not a very good language for talking about this because of this ambiguity in the word multilingualism. So the other point that I want to bring to having sort of talked about these issues of linguistic diversity is this notion of meaning, because I think it depends on what it means to choose a particular language when you portray a message. And in particular, bring up the notion of so-called like affective aspects of meaning. Um, this is the kind of emotional or other kind of meaning that might be conveyed or attitudes that might be conveyed by a message alongside its so-called denotational meaning. Denotational meaning is a sort of fancy term for meaning that really can be understood, say for a sentence, outside of its context of use, what you might call like it's, what are, what's often called like it's literal meaning, um, whatever that actually means, so the literal meaning of something. But there's this whole separate set of effective meanings communicated through language, um, language and this can be done in different ways. Um, but the affective aspects of a message are important for it to be not only understood by someone, but also trusted. And, um, that particular question about how does a message become trusted was concerning us as linguists when we were trying to think about translation to help people during the COVID-19 pandemic, speakers of minority languages, that is. 
Um, and what's important to bear in mind is language choice in and of itself can impact the effective meaning how a message is perceived in terms of attitudes and sort of emotionally and how it's received by someone who either hears or sees the message. Um, so for instance, if a language is associated in a particular country with government institutions and the government is not trusted, that lack of trust might carry over into the message that's in the language of government. Similarly, if we think about an African context, which is what I know best here, um, you could have a widely used colonial language like French or English, but it can never be fully dissociated from the legacy of colonialism, and that will obviously also affect how it's received by people who are listening to it. Um, on this slide, I've, I've put up a poster that I saw that was put together to, to help with um, COVID-19 issues designed for the Navajo Nation. As you can see, this particular poster actually puts Navajo above English. I don't actually know. I'm not a member of the Navajo Nation, so I can't say how they would respond to it. But it's interesting, symbolically, Navajo was put ahead of English. Obviously, that will signal something and affect its, its reception in one way or another. Even for someone who might not have Navajo proficiency, who identifies as Navajo, does not have that proficiency, the fact that the poster is structured that way will impact in some way how they understand and perceive it. Um, and then another important point that was also, I think, in my mind, certainly, is that um, at the present moment, majority languages are the primary vehicles for disinformation and misinformation. And as more and more disinformation and misinformation is spread via majority languages, that's going to necessarily affect how messages are, are received in those languages when they're created with them. Um, English may become less trustworthy as a medium of communication because it's also one of the most favored outlets for misinformation and disinformation as well. I'm looking at the time, I wanna make sure that um, just, uh, I want to make sure I give time to my collaborators, so I'll just make sure I, I don't take up too much more time. Um, but I want to just illustrate the effective meaning of language choice with a, a concrete example. This is from a market in Cameroon in the region where I've worked. It's data collected by uh, Dimitri Asene, um, sorry, Dimitris, um, sorry, Angiachi Dimitris Asene Aguara, who did a PhD looking at multilingual language usage um, in the lower Fungum region of Cameroon. And what we see here, you can ignore most of the fancy notation if you'd like, but the core thing to focus on here is we have an interchange to buy avocado, avocados between two women who know each other quite well. They share lots of languages in common as well. So they have lots of languages to choose from in which to conduct this exchange. They pick one of the local languages known as Misong, and that's where most of the turns here are coming through about, do you wanna buy avocados? Are they ready yet? Can I eat them or not eat them? What's really striking in this interchange that, um, Asene Aguara noted, is the last line of the interchange shifts from Misong, a local language, a language of a close small community, to Cameroonian Pidgin English, uh, listed as CPE here. That's a local lingua franca. And this last turn was given in the local lingua franca, basically saying, I want to eat these avocados now, right away. And what the person is conveying is, I'm not going to buy your avocados at this moment because I want to buy avocados that I can eat um, at this particular moment. Uh, Asene Aguara found that Cameroonian Pidgin English, the lingua franca, was used quite often in exchanges like this to actually break close personal connections and signal a bit of distancing. It was kind of a polite way of breaking off the conversation uh, with a friend in a way that kind of signals now we're actually operating in the general lingua franca space of the market. We're not close friends and I'm going to use this to distance and walk away in a polite fashion. What does that mean if I do a public health message in Cameroonian Pidgin English? Does the fact that it's a lingua franca cause it to be received in a more general way and viewed as strong general knowledge? Or does it actually perceived as socially distant and less trustworthy? We actually don't know that. This is something that we would like to study in the future. And I don't know of much research on how language choice matters in these, in these communities uh, that are dominated by lots of small local languages as well as an outside widely used lingua franca. I think in addition to the choice of language itself, one thing we were also looking at is the way in which a message was conveyed and communicated. On here, I have a, a poster made by Translation Commons uh, in the Torwali language, a minority language of Pakistan. On the right is an image of a traditional town crier from the Bafut, Bafut community of Cameroon. Um, American English speakers are accustomed to seeing public health messaging written in sort of decontextualized fashion on signs, like what we see for this Torwali example. So maybe we would take it seriously. I have no idea how a Torwali speaker would understand that, especially given that the symbols of authority on the message are written in English, whatever Panlex is and translation commons. Um, should they trust them? I'm not sure. Whereas if you use something like a traditional town crier, it fits into a known cultural framework for transmitting information, which we think would be building trust there. Um, and so observation like these led us um, as part of a large team 
right, um, to develop this viral languages project. Uh, Kasha supported us um, as, as an important public health sort of expert as we were developing this project, as well as many others, including my close collaborator, Pierpaolo De Carlo. I don't want to go into all the details of the workflow here, but at their core, we developed a workflow that centered on, on three things. We had a team of people like researchers who had access to accurate information on COVID-19, um, and they used this to produce a reference text containing key information about how communities could try to remain healthy during the pandemic. Local teams then in different communities were assembled and they would read the reference text and, text and take a quiz on it to ensure that they understood its most important points. And then members of that local team would produce recordings conveying the key context of the reference text for their own communities. We really wanted to have a team there so that they could critique the message and help ensure its accuracy so that only the best possible information was going to the communities. Um, and then after this, the viral languages coordinators helped with dissemination of these messages that were produced. And so our goal was to find a way to rapidly create good messages that would help people um, that could be distributed to minority language communities throughout the world. And in, that would be transmitted in a way that would promote trust in their content. But I actually wanna conclude, I, I'll try not to dwell on this too long briefly on some of our experiences and how we would do things differently um, about the project. I actually think, First, I want to point out this method we developed is not specific to COVID-19, even if that was the impetus for the work. Um, but I also want to have some self-reflection here. Um, I think in the 1990s, linguists could not have done this kind of work because we didn't have a good global network that was connected to so many communities across the world. At least scholarly linguists were not in a position to do this. Some missionary linguists might have been. Um, but by 2010 or so, the networks had been established because of a real emphasis on endangered languages. Um, but for whatever reason, I never considered taking this approach sooner and other linguists hadn't. It was really the COVID-19 pandemic that pushed us to do this. And I actually think this is kind of a problem um, and it was maybe a bit selfish of us, meaning that we could have done it sooner, but it wasn't until we hit a pandemic that affected us, a global public health crisis that we started asking what would be our role in dealing with public health issues. I don't know why we didn't think about this for say malaria or cholera, but it just didn't cross our mind. Um, my next observation to be critical is that the first version of our approach was really, unfortunately, it replicated power dynamics of the global north and the south. We decided the COVID-19 message that the people needed to hear. We translated it and gave it to them with this belief that somehow it would help them. When Dukkha Bai presents, uh, I think you'll hear about how this was really not the right approach. And as we move to the next phase of the work, what we really want to do is do something similar, but really open up a two-way communication channel to find out what the communities need and then see if we can find ways to give them information on, on, on the points that interest them. Um, I'll finish now and I'll hand over the floor to Vasiliki so she can talk about her experiences on the project. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you for inviting me to this event. I will start with some information about my background and role in viral languages. So when the pandemic first started in the UK, I was a student of the MA in language description and documentation at SOAS. As with many MA programs in language documentation and description, students attend field methods classes where they're taught how to elicit language data from language consultants for linguistic analysis. Very few programs used to offer classes in language revitalization or even the social linguistics of language endangerment. I believe nowadays more and more programs are informing interested students about topics like this. However, it's still difficult to implement and practically teach about collaborative language projects that do not necessarily lead to formal linguistic analysis or descriptions of the language, but consider other factors associated with language maintenance and revitalization, primarily community and individual well being and development. I have to say that I was lucky enough to read about such projects and hear of such projects at SOAS because of my current supervisor, Julia Salabank, and ELAR, the Endangered Languages Archive. During my MA, I volunteered uh, a lot for ELAR for various events while it was still at SOAS. It has uh, now moved to Berlin and the SOAS World Languages Institute. Through Leonor Luxi and Sydney Ray, the technical and operations managers of uh, uh, the project of our languages, I became part of the team as the social media coordinator. On the right hand side of the slide, you can see some of my responsibilities which included putting together the social media pages of the project, uploading the content and circulating it on the project social media. I was also in charge 
of handling interactions on Facebook and have participated in some outreach events. So if, you could, if we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Vera Languages uh, was the first collaborative language project that I participated in. It was not only collaborative between a linguist and a speech community as it usually happens, but also interdisciplinary between linguists from the global north, linguists from the global south, public health specialists and community members. As part of the team, apart from devoting my time to uploading content on social media, I also contributed in drafting multiple versions of the reference text, which was proofread and edited by Kasha, and more recently, Ahmed Soliman, who is a PhD student um, at the University at Buffalo, um, and I think he's still currently working on it, as well as Pier Paolo De Carlo. By using Google Docs, we collaborated and put in together a text that contained accurate health information on COVID-19 and was context appropriate. Through our, through our collaboration on the text, I learned more about contagious diseases in general and COVID-19 in particular, as well as the type of information that is usually circulated during health crisis, such as uh, symptoms of the disease, transmission information, what to do if you get infected, how to avoid getting infected, as well as um, which sources um, uh, researchers in the Global North would consider more trustworthy. For example, websites such as the NHS or uh, the CDC or the WHO. I also learned which information to include considering where our audience was and their experiences. Uh, for example, at a later version of the, of the reference text, Kasha had pointed out that it might be difficult um, to get water to wash uh, one's hands as often and for as long as it is considered safe to kill bacteria in Africa. So we tried to find other alternatives to suggest, such as ash, for example. As I mentioned earlier, as an MA student, I tried to read all about collaborative language projects because it corresponded to my interests as an applied language linguist and a professional language teacher. The pandemic broke out at the same time as I had to write my dissertation. And since I was suddenly incapable of conducting field work, I chose to work with archived materials instead and eventually managed to get in touch with speakers of the language I was working on and conducted remote field work. I think, however, that it was through viral languages that I learned how to work collaboratively online. Through viral languages, I learned that it is very important to use means of communication that are closer and accessible to local collaborators. For example, WhatsApp in Africa, emails and Facebook in Pakistan, Facebook and Zoom in Palau, where my research is. This also helped us identify the sources of misinformation and how people access them. Documentary linguists have been talking about our responsibility to give back to the communities that we work with. And that's usually in the form of gifts, a salary, a grammar, or a dictionary of the language, both of which are usually very expensive and difficult to read. I think that the Viral Languages Project has shown that there are other ways in which, as linguists, we can give back to the speech community, which usually desires a closer and long-standing relationship with us, rather than one that is ephemeral. There are, after all, far too many examples of linguists, anthropologists, or other researchers where they go for the data and they never go back. Through viral languages, I learned how to form mutually beneficial relationships with researchers and collaborators in the global south, as we are and we have collaboratively shared our work together in various outlets. Finally, another topic that usually comes up in collaborative language projects is capacity building. That is, linguists talk about training community members in using software for linguistic analysis or linguistic terminology, viral languages as well in the beginning by providing information on COVID-19 and resources on how to record oneself, uh, which you can see on the right hand side of the slide, um, aimed at capacity building as well in the sense that we tried to encourage and enable people to produce messages that are useful and trustworthy to them. We also encourage them to circulate them through means that are were available to them. For example, we were advised that YouTube might not be a good platform for 
for circulating the videos because of high data consumption. Instead, we created an account on Internet Archive where collaborators downloaded the recordings and circulated them via WhatsApp. I was inspired by the work we did with Vara Languages, and after my MA, I proposed a collaborative language documentation project to my collaborators in Palau, who also helped me with my MA dissertation. It entails collaborative corpus building and the production of pedagogical resources for sense release and endangered language of Micronesia. As with Vara Languages, I invited collaborators of different backgrounds and anthropologists to local school teachers and politicians, as well as nature conservationists. The positive effects of language and or cultural revitalization in maintenance projects on well-being have been mentioned by many and by involving local politicians and activists, we hope to further the domains of language use from just the home that is currently the primary one to the state level, um, that is the, um, that is in um, at the hospitals or in health administration, as well as education, um, as that is where I can contribute more effectively. Through participatory action research, I aim to involve the community in all stages of the research process, from planning to implementing and later evaluating. Furthermore, aiming at the creation of pedagogical resources rather than expensive and difficult to read linguistic, formal linguistic grammars, I hope to give back to the community, which allows me to work with them and study their language. As for empowerment and capacity building, I hope to create meaningful and long lasting relationships with the community and to participate in other future language projects that they or we propose. For example, I am currently mentoring an undergraduate student in linguistics who is a speaker of the language by sharing resources, co-authoring a paper together, and providing recommendations and advice for her future plans. Instead of just building capacity, working together, being patient, and listening to each other are lessons I learned from my experience with Vire Languages. This is also evident in the revision of the model to encourage a two-way communication between the researchers in the Global North and the researchers and community members in the Global South that Vira Languages aims at, to achieve in its next phase. To sum up, I think the lessons I learned are also less, lessons we learned as a team. People in different contexts have different ways of receiving information and or disinformation. For a health message campaign to be su successful, we need to be aware of which means are most accessible to whom. As, earlier, as mentioned earlier, downloading the recordings from Internet Archive was more accessible to viewing them on YouTube. And in some cases, circulating the recording on the radio was more appropriate than sharing it on social media. To reach the right people, you need to focus on the right topics. People were interested in continuing with their lives, go to the market, visit relatives, go to school. When vaccinations started becoming available, people were more interested in how to get back to normality while protecting themselves from the virus. So for some time, we put together a text with information on what to do at a funeral, what to do in public transport, what to do if you go to the hospital. However, as mentioned before, any recommendations we have made or will make cannot be considered universal. People in different contexts have their own experiences and needs. Finally, and personally, I think these were the most important ones. Patience, punctuality, and engagement were lessons that we learned through collaboration and led us to new collaborations. For example, in the beginning of 2021, we worked together with Bamidele Olowokere, a language activist uh, from Nigeria, and Margaret Chinemo, a linguist from Cameroon, to create and circulate a Google form survey on the impact of COVID-19 on people's lives, thoughts on vaccination, and the circulation of misinformation surrounding vaccination in various contexts in Africa. And with this, I conclude my part and pass the baton to Ndoko. Bye. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening to everybody. Uh, Thank you, uh, Jeff, for inviting me to be part of this event. So I will, are you getting me, everybody? Okay, yeah, so um, I'll be talking from uh, the perspective of somebody who is uh, working 
from the ground recording some messages, but I will talk a little bit about my background. So when the uh, COVID uh, started, I was like PhD candidate at Leiden University just at the final year. And well, it's like at some time I had to run back to my country because it was very difficult, very tough in Europe when it started. So I finally had to finish my thesis uh, back in Cameroon. So, uh, and while doing that, I was also working with uh, many uh, other minority languages. And I myself, I speak a minority language that is Mafa, and it has about like maybe 500,000 people. Some people, yeah, can estimate to 1 million, but it's not more than that. So, uh, what was my role? Um, or my involvement in the viral languages, I was like translating uh, from uh, English to French because I mainly worked with uh, uh, French speaking background community or audience. I was also recording messages of sensitization, uh, sensitization against uh, COVID-19. Um, I also plan for the broadcasting of messages um, in some radio station in the front of the Cameroon uh, because we didn't have um, access to uh, TV. So we only had a, a radio station. I also connect with the um, viral languages coordinator. Then I do the follow up on the impact of the message on the behavior of some uh, targeted uh, language speakers. And then of course, I recorded um, the messages for about five languages, uh, which are my own mother tongue, Mafa. Uh, as I said, it has about 500 uh, speakers. Mofu uh, has about 60,000 uh, native speakers. Molko is a little bit small. People will estimate the native speakers as uh, 10,000 or even less than 10,000. So it's really very minor. And then the Giziga, of course we have two Giziga. We have Giziga North and Giziga South, but I did it in Giziga North. And they are also estimated around 20,000 uh, native speakers. And then for full day, of course, it's a, a very huge language, and, but there are a lot of varieties. So we have in Cameroon, what they call Adamawa for full day. I can't tell the uh, the figure, but maybe there are two million, three million, or even more. So it's a kind of huge language. So uh, if we can move to the next slide, uh, yeah. So uh, this is uh, an elite that is a, a very important personality uh, within the uh, Mufu community. So we just met in his home. And we did the, uh, you know, the recording. And so this is his attitude, talking uh, to his community in his uh, Mufu language. So uh, I was very impressed because he was uh, uh, very collaborative and, uh, you know, very willing to help and pass out the messages to the uh, Mufu community. So it was a very experience working with him. Uh, next slide, maybe, yeah. Yeah, so I uh, will talk about yeah experience in producing messages of sensitization against COVID, and of course I have learned uh, some experience from the, uh, the, the the ground. So first of all, it was the reaction of people. You know, um, the reaction was sometimes well people were very uh, reluctant to talk about it. Some people were panicking, a lot of panic among the people. And of course, I was very touched when they asked me, well, you people have been talking about the end of the world. So maybe this is the end of the world that has started and we will all die. So that was a very uh, nice opportunity for me to see you know, this kind of reaction. And of course, it was a moment of uh, practicing or exercising patience for me, because uh, you know it's, it was not very easy to uh, just go and work with people at that moment because of uh, you know uh, of what was going on. 
So we were, people were really distant from each other. So uh, in some cases, uh, people will volunteer to produce messages, but in other cases, it was not very easy because they don't know what I'm, I, I'm going to do with the, 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 their voices. Some people will say, why are you, you know, trying to record our voices? Are you going to worsen the case of this uh, pandemic uh, situation? So it was not very easy uh, at all. So we move to the uh, next slide where there are other experiences. Yeah, so uh, convincing people about the real existence of COVID was really a matter in the especially in the far north of Cameroon where I, I live, it has been a real challenge because, well, people didn't really believe if the virus is something that is real or if it is just fake and, you know, manipulation because we couldn't see obvious cases of COVID. And as I'm talking, uh, it's like I have never seen somebody suffering from COVID. I'm sorry to say that, but I have never seen because we only hear about it on the air, on the TV. Yeah, of course, the government will always put pressure on people and say, well, there is a disease and blah, blah, but people are coming. I mean, they will always talk about people coming from Europe at that time. So when people are learning in Cameroon, we are only afraid of them. We say, oh, they have got it. That disease that is not, I mean, it's coming from there. So it was not easy and people will not wear their masks because they said, well, maybe this is not something that we know in Africa. It's uh, something meant for the other people. And of course, um, hospital has become uh, a problematic at that time. So even if people are sick, what they will do is, they started going back to the traditional pharmacy, consult people. And I remember some people complaining, well, my father died. The, the guy, he knew how to uh, cure uh, some diseases, but now he died and, uh, and he didn't teach me how to uh, cure diseases because now we have heard that there is a very big disease that is spreading all over in the hospital. So where are we going to? To, to get healed. So people were more and more, you know, getting back to the uh, traditional pharmacy than uh, going to the hospital. So part of my job was also to try to uh, include some messages to tell people, hey, please don't be afraid of hospital. I mean, we have practitioners that who can at least attend to your needs. And if you are sick, please just go to the hospital. But there are some kind of, there are some behavior that you have to uh, adapt so that you can be safe. And some people, of course, uh, asked me if there will be this kind of mobilization that we see around uh, COVID, if this can happen with diseases like malaria and cholera. And of course, I couldn't answer this kind of uh, uh, question because I have lived here in Africa for many years and we have always been struggling with cholera. Every year we have cholera and malaria is, yeah, almost all the time we have malaria, but all the complaints that we have, like if I take the case of Cameroon, is everybody will say, well, are we going to find the, 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 the drugs or the medicine against malaria one day? This is our worry, we don't know. And it's like nobody's, yeah, there are some programs around the world, but we think like, well, maybe it doesn't interest the, 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 the whole globe, the, the world, maybe because it doesn't exist in other parts of the world. But I mean, people were really questioning why African, typical African diseases are not catching the attention of uh, the developed world. So uh, we move ahead, <coughs> sorry. And then of course, uh, in the process of all those things, at a certain moment, I had to try to assess and see uh, what we have done with the people. And when we try to uh, broadcast the messages uh, 
on those uh, radio station and even in the community, I realized that the content of the message were not seen as important because it, they, 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 the, the pandemic didn't do great impact. I mean, in, in the area where we, yeah, we did the, uh, the recording. I have never heard that uh, somebody died of uh, COVID in the Mufu or the Mafa or wherever. But interestingly, uh, the approach, the, which consists in translating the message from English or French to uh, local languages, that approach created uh, some curiosity and turned out to be you know, more attractive. And I think it wouldn't have been that way if it was done like in English or even in full day, because people think that, well, this is the language of the other people, so maybe this message is not our own. But when the message is carried to them in their own mother tongue, people really pay attention to it. And even if they don't understand, because I can acknowledge that, that some of the translation or some of the way the messages were uh, recorded may not be meaningful to the people. Because, you know, when you try to uh, take an information from one language to another one, uh, it, it's not really translation which may be betraying, but sometimes uh, they, 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 there may be some gap, there may be some, uh, you know, um, distance between uh, what is the message in the, in the source language and then in the target language. But at least people paid attention to what was done in their languages and yeah, it was uh, uh, very nice to uh, see that kind of things happening. So we move on. Yeah. So I think um, other lessons that I I learned uh, the mobilization around COVID from what we see was really unprecedented. We have never seen this kind of at, at least as long as I am alive because I don't know if something uh, happened like that in the past, but I don't know. But I mean, to us, it was like. The world is just, you know, things are falling apart. So we've never seen this kind of mobilization uh, around the world. So the question is, can the world, can the whole world share the same concern about malaria and cholera, which kill many people every year in Africa? If we can do that, I think if we have found at least vaccine against uh, COVID, and there are a lot of them now. And I think we can also try to have vaccines against malaria and even cholera. So, yeah, is it possible for the world? Can somebody advocate for that so that uh, we can see this kind of mobilization that happened around COVID? So, as I said, since I live in uh, a zone where there is malaria and cholera every year, I have learned how people are quickly affected by this disease. So we go ahead. Still in the uh, other lessons learned. Uh, so I have, you know, learned the comparison between COVID and Boko Haram. Because uh, where I did the recording, it is the place where Boko Haram is very active until now. And so uh, when Boko Haram started, many people in terms of uh, economy lost their job. And I see it, it happened with COVID. Uh, if I take the uh, asset where I am working with Boko Haram, when Boko Haram came, we had in the northern part of Cameroon many people from Europe, from the US, who were working there. But when Boko Haram started, everybody started to jump into the first plane to go back to their country or the, those who didn't go back to America or Europe came and stay in Yaoundé. So I was like, well, what are we going to do when the, all those people are leaving us here? And of course, those who are working, they lost their job. So it is possible to physically fight against Boko Haram. That's what I see when we try to compare with COVID. But there is, I mean, there is no way to fight COVID physically. So it's kind of different from um, uh, Boko Haram. Many villages have been 
empty due to Boko Haram, whereas with COVID, I have noticed the reverse because uh, we think that the villages are more safer than uh, town because uh, you know the life in the village is not like in town. The, when you go to the town, there are a lot of people, but in the village, villages are very scanty and uh, it's not like in town. So I have heard people saying that it is better to leave the town and go back and hide in the village. And of course, there is a, a yeah. So many people decided to do that, to try to leave uh, uh, big cities like Garua, Gaudere, Marwa to go closer to where the, uh, the, 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 they, are, they are born. The, the idea is if we have to die, it's good to die in his village rather to die somewhere else. So here in the north of Cameroon, people consider COVID as the second Boko Haram. They know what happened with the arrival of Boko Haram uh, terrorists. And uh, so I think um, uh, people are very, very afraid of Boko Haram. And they were also afraid of COVID. But at the end, because we don't know, maybe it's already the end or not, but like here now completely people don't talk about uh, COVID anymore. So people, some uh, started questioning why have they been afraid by nothing because they haven't seen what was, you know, making people to be uh, more and more afraid. So we move to the last, I think, uh, slide. Oh no, not yet. So COVID has also been compared somehow to leprosy. And I, I think, uh, yeah, when I grew up, I have seen people uh, suffering from leprosy. And in terms of, yeah, contamination and quarantine, it's almost the same because I remember there is a place uh, in Mokolo where I grew up and uh, it, it's called in French leprosy. That is where the lepers are kept. So, and I remember many people from my village, they were mandated to go and live there in that center. So nobody will come to the village because they say, no, if you go back to the village, you will spread the disease. So all those who had leprosy, they have to be in one camp. So uh, yeah, leprosy was a disease of poor people. That's another thing, was a disease of poor people, whereas COVID seems to be a disease which moves around the world. Yeah, that by plan, that is, people who can afford the mean to take a plan and go abroad. So, I mean, we try to compare it and say, well, maybe leprosy is the disease of poor and then COVID is uh, the disease of rich people. So some people will say, okay, if this is the disease of the rich people, uh, I thank God I'm not rich, so it will not you know, come to me. And I have also learned uh, the development of some terminology around COVID. So for example, the, uh, the, 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 the mask, this is how we wear the mask. And you know, when I grew up as a child, I was taking care of the goat, the, uh, the, the, the sheep, so the, the, the cattle. And so what we used to do is, before you walk out the, uh, the, the, the cattle from the house to where there is a, there are grazing places, you have to put uh, a muzzle uh, to the animal so that on the way they should not, you know, destroy uh, crops. So, I mean, even until now, Mafa people, they will call the, 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 the mass uh, the muzzle, I mean, in, in, in our language. So we will say, oh, you are wearing the Zola. The Zola is the name for uh, what we are putting for the, the animal. So the idea behind this association is that human beings have become maybe like less important than animals nowadays because things are happening that we don't understand anymore. Yeah, and because they will tell you, okay, you don't greet people. You have to run away from somebody. You should keep distance with uh, another person so people cannot understand that. Yeah, we move on to... Um, Right. So you have a few more. Did you want to go to the end or do you want me to go through some of the slides quickly? Yes. Yeah. Just go quickly and then uh, I go to. Uh, okay, so you can see. So. Yeah. 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 So in the North Cameroon, maybe the fact that they're. Yeah. So people said, well, 
maybe the fact that um, we don't kiss or hug people when greeting has helped stop in the transmission of the virus. We don't know. And then African solidarity has been tested during this pandemic because they will tell, okay, people are not allowed to attend funeral. And the government will say only maybe five people will go to the uh, uh, removal of the cops of somebody. So it was, uh, you know, very uh, difficult. Uh, we can go. Yeah. And I have noticed rapid change in behavior. People coming back from Europe or the US were not welcome anymore. Yeah. In the past, I mean, you go to the airport, people are, I mean, it's crowded because people want to welcome those who are coming from Europe. They will come back with the dollars, with the, uh, with Euro. But with COVID, no. I, now, if you are coming to from Europe, don't, no, no, stay with your disease. And they are kept in some hotels and things like that. So, yeah, it is, uh, yeah, there is this change in behavior. And then, paradoxically, there were few cases of COVID. And I have never seen, as I said, somebody uh, suffering from, uh, from it. Some sense of failure. The reaction to the message about COVID was perceived in diverse way and different from what uh, we expected. Um, we move ahead. So, yeah, and there are some additional anecdotes, as I said, uh, and I will start with my own parents. So, yeah, they told me, well, if it is the time to die, we will die together. Because when I say, okay, mama, okay, papa, we don't do this now because uh, we, there is a disease coming all over, and they say, no. Of course, if we have to die, we will die together. So they never accepted the recommended protection uh, measure. And they kept asking me if the world is finished. If it is the end, then it is the end. And there is also an antidote of fear. I still remember some people who left the major cities of Douala and Yaoundé. That is far from the front of, of Cameroon, like 2,000 kilometers away. And they came back to the village and on motorbike. So for them, it was the end, and they wanted to be buried in their village. They came back, uh, so they went to Mokolo because they think uh, in town, the uh, disease is propagating, whereas in the village, as I said earlier, uh, it seems to be less propagating. So I think, uh, uh, lastly, the final observation, it was strange that the messages sent around to translate into our language dwell most of the time on what people had to do, rather than what people know locally about how to protect themselves if somebody, I mean, if something unprecedented happened. But all the messages dwelled around, yeah, you have to do this, don't do this, do this, but not how can you, you know, try to look for a local solution to uh, fight against it. And then finally, if something like COVID happens again today, what will be the reaction of people? Will it be confidence or fear? I think the wise thing to do will be to let every community to try to come up with concrete responses instead of creating a general response under the banner of pandemic. They say, oh, it's pandemic. And uh, maybe it is not right, but yeah, I think it would be good to, uh, you know, allow uh, all the communities to try to look for um, a response. So yeah, thank you very much. That's what I have to say. Thank you for that, for the whole presentation and uh, Dadak for your, um, for your thoughts and, and reactions from, from your communities. Uh, so uh, we'd now like to open the, um, the floor to questions from, uh, you know, feel free to uh, converse amongst yourselves, but also uh, questions from, um, from our um, audience, our attendees, are now welcome and I'm going to hand it over to um, Professor Raja who is uh, a, a, another co-director of, uh, of the Community for Global Health Equity um, to, to guide our discussion.
Sorry, I was adjusting my audio. My sound is coming from one place and face from another. First of all, thank you for that incredible um, talk, set of talks. Uh, this is a topic that I care about deeply as somebody who is a speaker of a language. I don't know, Jeff, how you would define it, but it's spoken by 11 million people. So I don't know, would that, what would that make it? I'm a Kashmiri language speaker. Yeah, it's funny. So if you're 11 million people in Europe, you probably have a nationally codified language and language yeah. classes and these things. So how many, like modern Greek, how many, how many people are in Greece? But about 11 10 million. million. 10 million. Yeah. So that's, uh -huh. that's the tricky thing. So if you're 11 million in Europe, you've got all of the resources, you have a spell checker, you have probably a voice to text system, you have Google Translate. And then if you're I mean, Kashmiri, I mean, I know the name, but it's one of these, the being like a minority language of, of China is even a little worse than being a minority language of India, right? Because well, you're- Just to clarify, I don't think of Kashmir as part of India, sorry. Oh, fine, sorry. I don't mean to, I'm, I'm only talking about political <laughs> okay. borders, sorry. I don't mean just, any- Just being clear. Yeah. Um, but um, so I, your graph, first of all, Jeff, that showed the, um, how many languages there are and how many people speak it. I think the data was just incredible. And then bringing that home to particular experiences from uh, the other two speakers was just really incredible. So first of all, thank you very much. Um, I have a set of questions, but I also want to invite other guests who might be dialed in. Um, it is afternoon and I'm kind of sorry to say the weather in Buffalo is very nice, so we might have lost people to good weather. <laughs> uh, my question actually begins with um, you, Jeff, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. I think some of your comments got me started on that direction, but I'm curious about your guidance on this. So going forward, things like COVID, I fear are not going to go away. They are going, we will have new kinds of challenges. Um, and if you had to make a recommend, and I'm a policy person, if you had to make a recommendation to say either international organizations like the UN, especially those that deal with rights-based conversation. First of all, do you think of language as a right, uh, being able to express yourself? And then if that is the case and uh, the context in which you shared it around vaccines, uh, would you, what would you recommend to an entity like the World Health Organization and simultaneously the UN um, HCR? Um, and then if you could scale it down, to, because the, my head, as I was listening to all of you, I was struck by the varied scales of language, who's speaking, what area it covers. And UN agencies tend to look at countries. They don't pay attention to sub entities. And so there's like a structural challenge here. They are making this, all their efforts at the member nation level, but what you are describing so well is really geographically um, different. So what do you do, what do you say to them in this context, given that differential geographic scale of their attention and your calls for attention to the other 6,000 6, languages? Oh, thanks for all those comments. I don't know if I can, I'll try to keep, there are a lot of things there. I, I wanna come, one thing you mentioned about whether language is a right or not, I wanna say that on some level, I guess in a professional capacity, I would stand back from that question because it's a political question, right? And my training doesn't necessarily guide me. I mean, I can have a personal opinion, right? But in this, like, I don't know that we as linguists are better suited to answering that. I can say though, that there is this question, I feel like just as a human, everyone should have the right to be able to communicate in a way where it, the messages are intelligible and meaningful to them. And I think where you see that rights discussion prominently in the US, for instance, if you look at the, um, like say American Sign Language and where that was, so you go through this phase of American Sign Language being developed, what we would consider fairly progressive. And then I think up through the sixties or so, this history is a little unclear to me. You go through this phase of oralism, 
which is where you try to force the deaf to basically use English, but basically they're deprived of a language because if you give a deaf individual a sign language, they have a full-fledged language. They can communicate just as well as anyone with a spoken language. If you try to force them into an oral mindset, they'll never have a single quote unquote native language, right? They won't have any language that they are able to express themselves in because they can't learn English in the same way that a, a hearing person can. So I, I kind of think of that as a framework and I think you could take that analogy to speakers of minority languages as well. This idea that everyone should be able to have the ability to sort of communicate fully in some language, right? And I think that probably the deaf community is an interesting community to sort of look at because they, it's a little easier to understand the issue, I think in that it, easier to communicate to people who haven't thought about these issues well exactly where they stand. And they've done a, an excellent job of advocating for themselves, at least in places like the US over the last you know, 50 or 60 years. Um, linguistics came into there only to establish, not me, but linguists to say, look, this is a fully functioning communicative system. This is not a degenerate system. It, it has the properties of languages. That's where the linguists come in to clarify sociopolitically, you might be unequal, but we don't see any evidence that they are actually deficient. In, in mm. if you put them, that's kind of where the that's where the linguistic side comes in. Um, and policy, yeah, I, one of the things when you talk about, I'm always struck by how much countries dictate how much we, we view the world. Um, obviously, the European nation right. comes in here and these ideals. The first thing I would say is again, you know, to look at a linguistic communicative strategy in terms of countries, and most of the world is just going to be to reinforce colonialism again and again and again and again. Right? We know this. There are very few states that are actually um, units of identity for the people of those states, right? I mean, the, the U.S. is a very strange place, right? Where everyone, the, the, uh, excepting the indigenous populations, of course, who have their own um, tragic and complex relationship, those who emigrate here sort of accept this state identity because they kind of came here to do that. But that's a very strange situation, right? Even if we're all accustomed to it. So if I was talking to a policymaker, I'd remind them, you know, the, the borders of Africa are colonial borders. They're not they're not African borders, right? They're, they're, why is Cameroon the shape it is? Well, it was a German colony that got divided between, we, we, we talk about Anglophone and Francophone Cameroon today because those became the languages of sort of state power. But you've just heard from the Kabai, there's all these other languages going on, but we use this, even the, the use of this Anglophone Francophone label itself just reinforces these, these kind of colonial divides. So um, just to remind them, and then in terms of policy, it's a big question. It's an interesting one. I guess the, the first thing, I don't know how WHO does its thing, right? I've never like been in Geneva or wherever, but I assume that when you have a question of disease spread, you talk to an epidemiologist. And when you're worried about, you know, social campaigns and things, you might go to a public health specialist that you go to specialists. I think the question is why don't, or do they have, are they asking themselves, do we need language expertise here? And what kind of language expertise do we need? And I think that actually we are, there's this ideology that I think again comes from Europe, again, comes from this, the academy and comes from a scholarship that basically, well, all languages are the same. We're all dealing in this kind of globalized enlightened space and that translations are enough as opposed to this, this really idea that localized communication matters. So maybe you also need specialists in, in, in communication. Maybe they have them at the WHO. Um, now, Having said that, I also want to be clear that it's not, I don't want to even say it's the WHO's fault. The discipline of linguistics itself has not structured itself in a way to suggest that it has anything to offer here. There are lots of reasons for that. It's especially bad in North America. It's better in Europe. Europe could never ignore multilingualism, like the EU especially cannot. So Europe is more sensitive to that. America kind of can ignore it if, and get very far. So there are those complexities. Um, uh, the Kabai's organization, SIL International, is the organization that has put together for many years the definitive catalog of the world's languages. It is a Christian affiliated missionary organization, and it's really striking that it's um, a missionary organization that did that project, and the scholarly linguists kind of ignored it because they just didn't see that as a central question. So there's this other discipline, but I think from a policy side, you could just convince them to like find an expert on the languages of it's gonna still be by countries of India, unfortunately, because still the world's cut up that way, but at least you could find someone who doesn't see India as through the lens of the official languages, but through the lens of its actual diversity on the ground. Um, so that was a long answer. I don't know if that addressed your, your point. It does. Um, it does. It, uh, I mean, it's generating additional questions in my head, but I do wish that 
people in policy positions have the opportunity to work with linguists to better understand how language is in, uh, an intermediary for everything that they are trying to do. And I, I'm not sure, I, I'm sure WHO has communication experts, but I don't know if they are attuned to the issues that the three of you have raised. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks for getting us started. So we are getting some really great questions in the chat. And I want to begin with one that is um, directed to Dadoc. I hope I'm uh, saying your name right. Maybe correct me, please, if I'm mispronouncing. Yeah, Dadoc is fine. <laughs> I'll get to do something more than fine, but I will start there. <laughs> OK. So the um, comment is from a colleague here at the School of Public Health um, who really found your example of masks being equated with muzzles as interesting. And uh, she's asking, are there other examples you have come across of COVID related public health measures being viewed negatively because of associations that would not necessarily be obvious to people in the US slash global north, uh, looking for a few more examples. Okay. Well, thank you for the question. I will, uh, I will try. Well, I think um, apart from the mass, we, we have this, um, this two meter distance, you know, from people. In, yeah, it has been not, yeah, well perceived because I mean, for many reasons. The first reason is in our world here, uh, we, don't, we don't kiss people, as I said. When we greet ourselves, we just, it depends. If it, you don't have, uh, you just say hi or you, you can shake hands. But at least for us, we don't uh, bring our mouth towards the mouth of the other person. We don't do that. It's totally forbidden in public. In public. So when uh, it is in, incorporated in the message, we see it as something that is uh, out of its place. It doesn't concern us. Yeah. Then, apart from mass, um, uh, something like uh, uh, what else? I think. Um, I lost what I was thinking of to uh, as uh, the uh, other example of something that was perceived as, uh, you know, not good. I yeah, but I can come back to you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, so there's also a great chat happening around the experiences of. Um, refugees. So I'm going to come to that first. And then I have um, another question about the student experience. Um, so the question is about engaging refugees. And this is coming from, uh, uh, I think now, Dr. Frendak. Um, or has he defended Dr. Cordes? Oh, soon to be Dr. Frendak. Soon. A PhD student here at uh, School of Public Health. He is asking, how would you recommend engaging refugees? A lot of the discussion revolved around cultural norms uh, in the panel when using colonial languages. Sometimes in the US, we might resort to certain spoken languages because they're common like Arabic, but those languages might carry with it other baggage that shouldn't accompany public health messages. What would you recommend? And then Alex has provided some examples uh, of her reaction in which I um, think there were, uh, I'm just trying to go through Alex's response in which she is sharing that many of the refugee community leaders have done what, uh, and I don't want to butcher Vasiliki's name, so you have to correct me too. <laughs> sharing information in a culturally sensitive ways in venues that their communities use like WhatsApp. Um, so maybe can we address Seth's question? Is that something you wanna take on? 
Vasily, how do you say your name? It's Vasiliki, so the stress is at the end. Vasiliki? Yes, that's right. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. What's your recommendation um, on engaging refugees? Well, that's a good question. Although I think I think Jeff knows more about that. So is it okay if I pass that to Jeff? Yeah, totally. Yeah, sorry, I'm, but I'm happy. Hopefully you'll get another chance to give input, Vasiliki. Um, I've been thinking about this in different ways. Um, I think one thing actually goes back to the WHO comment, which is it's probably not safe to assume if you don't know the close situation of the linguistic situation of the refugees or their home countries, unfortunately, I don't even want to say countries, but again, you, you don't want to be locked into this country framework that it's an obvious question what the right language of communication would be. Um, where I think I see this a lot maybe is even with Swahili, which is a second language for many East Africans, but maybe not the right first language, but it's come, at least in American culture, it's come to stand in as the language of Africa in many respects. But it's really just a, it's a, it's a lingua franca of a part of Africa and a first language of a smaller group, um, not found at all in Cameroon. So you just don't, you don't want to look, you don't want to go to like the CIA fact book and say, oh, the language of the country is Arabic, right? You really want to find someone who knows. And then even like Arabic is very complicated because you've got modern standard Arabic against all the local varieties. Um, Chinese is, is the famous problem where Mandarin and Cantonese are not mutually intelligible varieties as spoken. Um, there historically were more Cantonese speakers who emigrated to the U.S., not as refugees at the moment. You know, so people don't even think this way, but you really should just see if you can get someone to walk you through it. Very often it's you don't even need the world's expert on this. You just need someone with a baseline, like, you know, at least you'll get a lot, you'll get pretty far with someone who has moderate level knowledge, and then they can get you in touch with the world's expert if needed. In a Buffalo context, Karen is a very complicated label linguistically and what, what, what that really means. Um, Could you say something more about why it's a complicated label? Because it seems to be a cluster of maybe related languages, but what I actually am not sure having worked with one Karen speaker is, the Karen refugees, we, they're sort of one kind of group with a shared identity, but there's lots of quote unquote dialects. I'm not even quite sure on their degree of mutual intelligibility. There's some literacy. I'm not even sure if the literacy is in a standard variety or their own local variety and what they're reading. There's also the fact that I talked to some where different linguistic groups left, um, you know, Burma, Myanmar, right? And then wound up in different refugee camps where they mix some of the different Karen groups were put side by side, and then different people from different refugee camps wind up in Buffalo. So you have this sort of twice ways mixing. So just because you even know what's happening in Thailand in the refugee camps there doesn't mean what you know what's happening in Buffalo. And then you may have mixed dialect, mixed variety households, uh, wife, husband. If you're me, you're gonna get more access to the husband and that might actually skew, I mean, me personally as a you know white male, you might not actually know what the mother saying to the children, you know, like, so that's kind of where, now I don't really know anything. I'm not an expert on the linguistic situation in Myanmar, but I know enough about Cameroon and I can look up what's going on in Myanmar to sort of piece, or maybe I'm a little better at conducting a sociolinguistic interview, which would be not hard to train someone else in, right? Mm -hmm. Just to know what questions do you ask? So when we work in Cameroon and I see, I said like his hand up, so I was up, like, we would never ask, like, we do not ask what's your mother tongue. We don't ask what's your native language because that presupposes that you only have one. And in fact, it might confuse the Cameroonian. They might think, you mean my mother's tongue? And they're gonna be like, and in fact, their father's tongue is more likely to be our conception of your mother's tongue. You know what I mean? So like, even just making sure you don't ask a leading question can just open up insights, you know? And But I could train someone who's good at interviews probably like in half an hour, just how to undo those assumptions and then you've gotten far. Does that make, you know, so. Um, last thing I'll say about refugees, I don't want to monopolize is one great thing about refugee communities in the U.S. as opposed, because we want to do a project with refugees in Africa, Boko Haram refugees, but in the U.S., you've got these like teenager and young adult intermediaries, and you could do lots of things with the ones who have been here as a young age, and they produce a, a community, a, an intermediary membership that I think if you can engage with them, you can do a lot with that's much harder on the international stage. Okay. Mm -hmm. cool. Thank you for that, uh, Vasiliki. Yes, um, I I do actually have a comment about that because um, so the School of um, of uh, Languages, Cultures, and Linguistics here at SOAS they recently started a a project 
uh, where they are looking at uh, the, the type of COVID-19 information immigrant communities have received in London, because London is, is as multilingual as New York, I think, with um, Polish being the, um, the language that is um, spoken most. Uh, by immigrant communities in London. And then the second language is, um, is actually Silheti. Silheti is a variety of Bengali, uh, but the speakers of Silheti, because of the, of the status of Silheti in Bangladesh, Bangladesh actually, um, when they completed the surveys, um, or when they complete surveys, like state surveys, they identify themselves as Bengali speakers. Um, so the project is um, is actually they are conducting uh, social linguistic interviews and qualitative interviews uh, with various communities in London to to identify where their so the source of information comes from, uh, which ones they find more more trustworthy. So. I think it's more or less what Jeff said as well, that I think qualitative interviews, uh, qualitative research and engaging with uh, the, these communities uh, could shed light to um, how to also create messages that are meaningful to them. Really interesting. And in fact, uh, now you have also reminded me another takeaway for policy the way in which we gather data, publicly accessible data, generates a whole host of decision-making. And one of them is about the question we ask about language. Um, I, I'll come back to that. Uh, you have just alleviated stress in my personal life, Jeff, because I was really struck by that question when I came to the US. People asked me what my mother tongue was, and I speak three, and so it just, it was super confusing. Okay. Um, <laughs> that comes back, that goes back to the nation state and colonialism, right? Right, your country exactly. country is your mother, your country gives you your language and your identity is all wrapped up, but that doesn't work in most of the world. It's a very, Correct. very Correct. distinctive social construction. Yeah. So um, I'm going back to a comment that uh, Dadok uh, highlighted another disparity that these diseases often found in parts of Africa are not capturing the world's attention the way COVID does. How as um, linguists, linguistics, do you deal with this challenge? Uh, okay, is the question to me? <laughs> sure, yes, please. Okay, well, I mean, these are our men uh, concern. We, I mean, it is something that I have noticed and everybody can notice it, that uh, there is this uh, uh, less concern about, you know, typical African diseases. So as a linguist, what can I do? Well, I can only advocate. I'm, I'm doing work of advocacy, but I don't think my voice will be heard by those who are economically powerful to do something. So maybe I will rely on uh, organization like, yeah, the one uh, topped by Jeff, if they can, you know, come up with uh, uh, some organized uh, idea of advocacy towards uh, those uh, super high organization that can help us, that can conduct research. For example, to find um, a vaccine against uh, malaria. But as a linguist, I don't think I am in a better position than somebody uh, maybe who is economically uh, powerful to do something. So I will ask Jeff to rescue. Maybe he has some idea. <laughs> I don't know. I wish I did. I mean, I, I, what I can do, I'm not, you know, in my own country, I'm not that economically powerful. I might be in Cameroon, but, um, but what I can do is, you know, be at a large university with specialists of all kinds, right? And then figure out the connections. And so what I see is you have the, the one degree of separation to your local communities. I've got the one degree of separation to world experts who will probably answer my email. Um, and then, and then what? I don't know. It still takes years, of course. No, nothing happens quickly. But um, what, what struck me about your comment to Doc when I was thinking too is 
you know, the public health campaign around COVID in Cameroon in some part was less successful because malaria and cholera had been so ignored that why do they trust us to come in about this? That it was like all of these inequities add to this the sense of distrust. And now we're saying this disease is important, but why should they believe us that suddenly COVID is the most important disease when we've been ignoring them? So I just, it just tells you how all these structural inequities prevent good things from happening in a crisis. Even mm. though we were trying to approach you from a position of equity, we kind of failed. And we failed to appreciate how poorly we had done in the past. And what, you know, why would you be two meters apart when we can't even cure malaria? Clearly we have the power. We shut down the whole world for COVID. That's how, I mean, I, I can, I, what really struck me about your comments was how much I could start to see the perspective of a Cameroonian in a village. You guys have the power and you didn't do anything till now. Well, okay, why, why do we listen now? I don't know, it was kind of sad in a, in a good way, in a provocative way. Well, we are getting close to end of time. Um, I want to maybe find hope in how students are being trained to build blocks of equity. So um, maybe share, if you don't mind, Vasiliki, um, what is a recommendation for students about why engaging in this way um, with a mentor in your own field or a colleague in your field along with somebody in um, a community that can affect change. Why is that kind of training meaningful? Well, um, let me think about it. <laughs> well, I think, I, think, uh, I think it is meaningful, um, like both uh, personally as an as an individual for myself but also I think for um, for my collaborators as well I think that we uh, many times we forget that when we work together we can achieve greater things um, and I've, I've learned I've learned a lot especially from Pier, Pier Paolo because we we work together more closely um, and he is a great mentor um, in the sense that um, he he pointed at direction directions that I I I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to to look at myself um, and he he gave me advice um, on um, and feedback on what I produced at all levels. Um, at the same time, uh, working with with Dokubai and Margaret uh, and Bamidele on um, creating um, methods of investigate of investigation, that's for the the survey that I mentioned earlier. It was it it also uh, helped me understand many things that from that were not from my perspective. And it's better to look at different perspectives so um, to to gain a, a holistic view of a, of a topic of, of a problem. Um, and I hope to, to do that with my research as well. Um, because I think that uh, wor working uh, by yourself on a PhD, I think many will agree it's it's a bit lonely, but at the same at the same time can be very limiting. So, yes, I think I think that's why. Um, that's a great uh, way to flip it. You can get rid of the loneliness of a PhD by collaboration and expanding your understanding of problems and research methods. Great. With that, I'm going to hand it back to Kasha to close us off. All right. Well, um, I will uh, express my really deep appreciation to the three of you. This was such a fascinating conversation. And I think it will allow us to go away and think more deeply about the work that we do and, and how we engage with our partners and, and really the motivation for our work uh, gets to see sort of the, the reflection from, 
from community partners um, how important it is to have that reflection about first of all why are we doing this and and and, and the reflection of what's important um, so thank you for that the doc that was that was just wonderful and and i hope we can sort of internalize uh uh, us here present and, and those people who will be hearing um, this webinar later on uh, to internalize that and, and sort of to carry that away with us because I think those are really critical questions so um, so thank you for that and, and thank you to uh, to our panelists and our audience um, members for for being with us and, and, and learning uh, so uh, with that I'm closing uh, see you next time <laughs> thank, thank you. you thank you thank you Thank you.